Hello, my name is Rick Pearson, and I'd like to welcome you to this second of a series of seven prophetic teachings entitled The American Revelation. In this lesson, we're going to look at the apostasia or moral falling away that will affect believers immediately before the tribulation begins. Jesus knew this would happen in the last days, and he warns his followers several types of sins that would seduce his church and lead them astray. Someone once challenged me on this teaching, saying that these historical churches have nothing to do with modern times. However, in studying the word, you must realize that although those believers are now with the Lord, the sins they were wrestling with still exist. It is the sin that Jesus is addressing in these passages. These churches of yesteryear fall under the theological tool known as typology. Typology is a description or type of believer then and there, which represents what believers in the last days will look like in the here and now. Jesus explains that these wrongful activities or sins are driven by spiritual entities. Satan uses these temptations to influence the thoughts, attitudes, and opinions of every generation. But the sins described in the following passages will manifest most predominantly in the last generation. The final result will be a reoccurrence of lifestyles very similar to the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah immediately before their destruction came. So in the following verses, Jesus warns us that in order to escape the last seven years of tribulation, you must make sure that you are not participating in these sins. If you are, it could determine whether or not you are found worthy to escape the tribulation soon to come upon the earth. He describes this scenario in Matthew 25 by a parable of ten virgin brides, five of whom were ready for the bridegroom's arrival and five of whom were not. And the latter five literally missed their own wedding. We must also realize that when Jesus refers to these churches, he's not talking about buildings. He's talking about the living church which are believers who have given themselves to Christ and formed a relationship with Him. These churches or believers are referred to by the geographical location where they were living. However, these believers are wrestling with sins that are blocking the relationship with Christ and unless they are dealt with, will disqualify them to be worthy of escaping the tribulation period. The first church that Jesus addressed is the church of Ephesus. And the first thing he says to Ephesus is he admonishes them for their labor and for their enduring patience in following him. However, something has happened to this group of believers. In Revelation 2-3, he says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up my namesake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember from, from where you have fallen and repent and do the works you did at first. This falling away is the word pipto. It means to fall from one level to another. These believers have left their first love. That word love is agape. It's used 118 times in the New Testament, and it means a godly love that is the highest form of love we can have towards God and then towards one another. The litmus test of your love is how you treat others. In my early 20s, I was a pilot for Oral Roberts Evangelistic Association. And after landing on a particular trip, I began reading the Bible. The evangelist asked me what I was reading and I told him I was trying to study prophecy and was quite flustered because the Bible says to study to show yourself approved by God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word. And at that time, I found the Bible was very confusing and I did not understand all the hithers and thithers of the King James Version. The evangelist quickly explained to me, you don't have to worry about trying to know everything in the Bible, Rick. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you and you have fulfilled all the law. This is what Jesus was trying to tell Ephesus. You go to church, you sing in the choir, you may even preach occasionally, 
But once you walk out of the building, you do not treat people the way you would like to be treated. Secondly, he tells them that they need to do the first works. If you love someone, you should be attempting to lead those people to Christ so they too can have eternal salvation as taught by Jesus. This is your first and foremost duty as a believer. Jesus' first commandments to the disciples in Mark 16, 15 said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Revelation 2, 5, he says, repent and do the works you did at first. Jesus is talking to this group of believers who become nothing more than a religious social club. They do not preach the first works of repentance and perhaps they're steeped in programs or works or social events, but they never lead people to Christ. Embracing everyone with love is mandated by God, but not warning people of the results of sin is a sin itself. For this, Jesus says to repent and return back to your original purpose, and I will grant you to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. Every church who preaches Christ must, must preach salvation through repentance. This is the first and foremost task of every church, to lead people to Christ. If the gospel message is not being preached in your church, it's become nothing more than a religious social club, not doing the first works of its primary mission. Now the second church that Jesus addressed, or the second group of believers, is found in Smyrna, Revelations 2.8. And these believers are facing severe persecution and poverty. Revelations 2, 9 says, I know thy works and thy tribulation and poverty, and I know the blasphemy of them that are of the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue of Satan here, that word synagogue means a house of assembly. And an assembly pertains to religious houses of assembly. It pertains to political houses of assembly or even social activist houses of assembly. Wherever people assemble, Satan can stir up a pack mentality which will express an anti-God ideology. Satan's ideology always opposes the authority of God's word, and especially those who follow it. That is why this ide ideology is likened unto the apostasia. It will always hate Jews and Christians. Satan continually opposes the authority of the word, as well as believers who are trying to follow that word. Reuters reports that since January 2013, there are approximately 2.2 billion Christians globally, and they represent 32% of the world's population. But today, Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world. Up to 70,000 Christians in North Korea have been sent to labor camps for their faith. Over 100 million Christians worldwide are persecuted. In 65 different countries, worldwide participate in Christian persecution. 90% of those countries are Muslim. They include Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Iran, and many African nations. According to the nonprofit organization Open Doors, the year 2014 resulted in record-breaking numbers of Christians martyred, tortured, and imprisoned throughout the world. Revelation 2.10, Jesus said to Smyrna, Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested for ten days. You will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. These verses should speak loudly to the Christians of the Mideast, who today are being slaughtered daily by radical Islam. Christians are fleeing in droves from these nations, and a global jihad of hatred is being released on Jews and Christians. Absolutely no one can deny these facts. Something is happening in the spirit realm around the world. Bible prophecy predicted it, and we are watching its fulfillment through every form of media outlet around the world. Jesus said, however, to be faithful unto death. In Psalms 116.15, it reads, Precious is the, in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. 1 Corinthians 1.18 reads, for the preaching of the gospel to them that perish is foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Revelation 12, 9, Jesus explains that since Satan was cast out of heaven, 
He has deceived the world and he continually walks about as the accuser of the brethren who accuses them before God both day and night. Today in North America, Christians have not yet experienced physical persecution, but we are experiencing verbal accusations by vast numbers of groups or synagogues of Satan or assemblies of people. If you stand up for traditional marriage, certain groups will yell that you're homophobic. If you stand against Muslim terrorism, they will scream that you're an Islamophobic racist. If you stand up for the life of the unborn, certain groups will say you have a war on women. If you stand up for a work ethic, they believe you're a greedy capitalist one percenter. If you say that you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way, you've become a non-inclusive, narrow-minded bigot in some people's minds. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, we find 120 disciples who were baptized in the Holy Spirit and began speaking in over 15 regional dialects the wonders of God. The Bible says in verse 13 that the observers outside were all amazed and were in doubt saying one to another, what meaneth this? However, others mockingly, the word is blasphemous, said these men are full of new wine. From this chapter, and even today, 2,000 years later, certain people from every generation will mock, scoff, and persecute followers of Christ. They do not understand, they do not comprehend, and they have never participated in the personal experience of fellowshipping with Christ. Jesus promised these believers of Smyrna that they will receive the crown of eternal life. Presently, out of the 2.1 billion Christians worldwide, 650 million claim to be charismatic, which have experienced Acts chapter 2 in their own life. But just as it was back in Jesus' days, people are still laughing and mocking the gospel of Christ. However, Jesus promised Smyrna to be faithful unto death and we would receive the crown of eternal life. The third church that Jesus addressed is the church of Pergamum. Revelations 2, 12 through 17. This third set of believers, evident in the last day, are represented by believers who are living a lifestyle in denial of sound doctrine and are deceived into living a lifestyle of sexual immorality. Revelation 2.13 reads, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you have not denied my faith. But Satan has found a throne in these believers. That Greek word throne is honorous. It's an entity or a place which authority to rule is exercised. Jesus said in verse 14, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Verse 15 says, So also some of you hold the doctrine or the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now Peter explained the doctrine of Balaam in 2 Peter 2.1. He said, but false prophets arose among the people, just as there were false teachers among you, bringing in destructive heresies, denying the deity of Christ, bringing upon them swift destruction. Full of adultery, greed, they have all gone astray. In verse 15, he said, they have followed the way of Balaam, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked by a speechless donkey with a human voice, and restrain the prophet's madness. So the question is, who is Balaam? Balaam was a false prophet at the time of Israel's entrance into the promised land in 1400 BC. We pick it up in Numbers uh, chapter 22, where King Balak of Moab asked Balaam to curse the invading Israelite army, but God intervened by speaking literally through the voice of a donkey warning Balaam, the false prophet, not to curse the children of Israel. Balaam obeyed the Lord, much to King Balak's dislike. Israel eventually defeated the Moabites, but Balaam convinced the Israelites not to kill the Moabite women. 
but instead take them as wives. Those wives eventually led Israel's men into embracing their pagan gods by worshiping the pagan god Baal. Those worship ceremonies involved immoral sexual activity. Those today who practice Balaam's tactics are motivated by a total lack of understanding that sexual sin is a form of defiance against God's laws. It is putting your sensual appetite ahead of God's moral code of ethics. The doctrine of Balaam is a doctrine of defiance. Revelations 2.15, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, or Nicolaitans work hand in hand with the doctrine of Balaam. In verse 15, it says, Some of you hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. This doctrine works from the top down within church structure by leadership actually teaching heresies to those who follow. The initiator of this problem began with a man called Nicholas of Antioch. We pick up his story in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. He was a leader within the church of Antioch. He converted from paganism to Judaism and eventually to Christianity. But Nicholas taught a doctrine of compromise, implying that total separation between Christianity and the practice of pagan rituals was not necessary. From early church records, it seems apparent that this Nicholas of Antioch was immersed in occultism. He had no problem intermingling his belief systems into various worship rituals, enticing other Christian believers to participate in these occultic practices. Now the name Nicolaitans is derived from the Greek word Nicholas, which is a compound of two words, Nikos, meaning conqueror, and Laos, meaning laity. Nicolaitan is a descriptive word which literally means leadership who are motivated in conquering and subduing believers of Christ by enticing them to leave sound doctrine and appealing to their fleshly desires. In Numbers 25, 1 through 3, it tells us, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they, the daughters of Moab, called the men of Israel unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the men of Israel did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal. This was the reason Jesus despised the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Jesus warned believers of this problem both in Pergamum as well as in Ephesus, which were centers for pagan and occultic activity. Present-day churches, influenced by these doctrines, deny the virgin birth, they deny the resurrection, they deny repentance from sexual immorality, they deny that homosexuality is a sin, Many of them even deny the existence of hell. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Hell is mentioned 54 times in Scripture, as Hades, the Abyss, Gehenna, or Shehel. If hell does not exist, then Moses was wrong, David was wrong, Solomon was wrong, all of the prophets were wrong, and Paul was wrong when he warned in Philippians 2.12 to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Even Jesus Christ himself was wrong when he preached Matthew 10.28, Don't fear man which can kill the body, but fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Once again, Jesus gives a solution to the doctrines of Pergamum. He says, repent, turn 180 degrees, stop doing what you're doing, and overcome these teachings, and I will give you a new name. The fourth church that Jesus addressed was the church of Thyatira. It is found in Revelations 2, 18 through 29. And it re represents Christians, again, who are living a hidden life of immorality. Revelations 2.19 says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance. He's talking to good people 
who love God and are working hard in the church. But in verse 14, he says, but I have a few things against thee for you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet and teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. In verse 20, he says, I gave her time to repent, but she refused to repent of sexual immorality. The word there is pornavu, where we get the word pornography from. And those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into the great tribulation. You have learned what some call the deep things of Satan. It should be noted here, Jesus tells us a good number of these believers will go into the great tribulation due to their insistence of living lifestyles of sexual immorality, which Jesus referred to as the deep things of Satan. Let's look at this woman, Jezebel. Jezebel was found in approximately 850 BC. She was the queen of Israel with King Ahab during the time of Elijah's ministry. Jezebel also practiced Baal worship, which Jesus referred to as the deep things of Satan. The background of Baal worship begins 3,000 years before Christ, but with Nimrod and Queen Semiramis, who reigned in the land of the Euphrates River, which is current day Iraq. This is where the Tower of Babel was built, and this region later became the great nation of Babylon in 600 BC. Therefore, Baal's origins began in what we most commonly refer to as the land of of ancient Babylon. According to the Bible knowledge uh, commentary, Semiramis claimed to have a son when she was still a virgin. Her son was allegedly killed by a wild animal and rose from the dead. From the deifying of this son came the fertility god known as Baal. Baal's counterpart was the female goddess Asherah in Canaan around 1400 BC. She became Ishtar hundreds of years later in Egypt and was worshipped in Babylon in 600 BC. To the Greeks, she became Aphrodite, and to the Romans in 70 AD, she became Venus. Now Asherah was worshipped by driving a pole into the ground, which historians believed were carved into the image of a woman. Both female and male sodomite prostitutes were used in the worship service. Rituals around the poles involve multiple forms of sensual activity, stimulating worshipers to participate in various sexual acts with the prostitutes as well as with each other. Baal and Asherah were both worshipped in this way. Believers of Jehovah have been seduced by this worship of sensuality as long as history has been recorded. From Joshua's entrance into the promised land in 1400 BC to Gideon's tearing down of the altar of Baal and the Asherah's poles beside it 200 years later in 1150 BC. That is found in Judges 625. In 850 BC, Elijah called down fire from heaven and single-handedly killed 150 of Queen Jezebel's prophets of Baal. By 670 BC, Josiah received 40 years of blessing upon the land of Israel because he thoroughly purged Israel from the sin of Baal worship. We pick that up at 2 Kings 23 verse 4. And Josiah commanded to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron. Verse 7 says, And Josiah broke down the houses of the Sodomites, those were the male prostitutes that were by the house of the Lord. Verse 12 says, And he tore down the high places on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Moabites. From the time of Joshua in 1400 BC to the book of Revelation in 85 AD, and even now, 2,000 years later, God has continually warned his people against the sensual erotic worship associated with this spirit he calls Baal. And until today, I'm sure that most of us thought pole dancing was a North American invention. How little have we learned in 3,400 years of history? 
Baal and Asherah are still worshipped this very day, and the deep things of Satan are slickly marketed through the multimedia world of the adult entertainment business. There are currently 3,500 strip clubs in North America, and they proudly raise the pillars of Astra, employing over 350,000 strippers nationwide, generating an a industry annual income of 2.5 billion. The word Baal in Hebrew literally means master. Millions of men are addicted slaves to this master, worshiping daily at their altars of Baal within their own households, viewing over 246 million pages of pornography provided freely through the internet. Within this $13 billion global pornographic film industry, Hollywood is the number one producer, completing one pornographic movie every 37 minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Believers in the church of Thyatira, then and there, were desperately deceived just as many believers are deceived today, here and now. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. But the warning Jesus gives us in Revelations 2.22 is this. Those who commit adultery with her, with Jezebel, I will throw into the great tribulation, except they repent. It should be noted that only those participating in the pornavu or pornography or sexual immorality would suffer the consequences of going into the great tribulation. In verse 24 of chapter 2 of Revelation, Jesus said, But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned or participated in what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay any burden on you. Again, we see that not all of the believers within the church are guilty, but only those who practice these things. And to them, Jesus once again provides a solution. Simply repent. And to those who overcome, he promises, I will give you power over the nations. 